Good morning. Before I begin, I do want to say uh, thank you to uh, David, to Sean, and to y'all. I've been gone the last several Sundays. Had to preach in Temperanceville a couple of weeks with my dad, and then a couple of weeks ago went up to uh, Massachusetts to visit a, a, a very dear friend who was very, very ill. Um, but we're glad we got to go, and thank you. A uh, special thank you to Sean Donaway, and he's not here this morning, but Danny Snyder for filling in for the teen class those few Sundays. It's, it's exciting and encouraging to know that there are servants who are willing to step up and, and fill in and serve when need be, especially on short notice at times. Now, if you're like me, most of us enjoy a good story. We like to read them, have them read to us, or even listen to a, uh, to listen to a storyteller. It's the way they, they talk and, and deliver. And the truer the story seems to be, the more enjoyable it is. One story that I like is the story of Jonah. I enjoy reading it, enjoy hearing about it, hearing people talk about it. There's a lot that can be learned, or that I learn every time that I hear about the story of Jonah. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on the word story. When I was growing up, um, I was in Texas with my grandmother. Anytime we'd play a joke on her or, or, or tell a little fib, she, she would always catch us and she would say, are you telling us a story? Well, a story, for a story to be real, it has to have four criteria. A real story has a definite time, a real time. A, a, a fictional story or a, or a fairy tale often begins once upon a time. Well, the story of Jonah has a real date. It happened during the reign of, uh, of Jeroboam II between about 750 and 800 BC. Don't know the exact date, but there is a definite time that the story of Jonah took place. Second thing a real story, ha or a story has to have to be real, it has to happen in a real place. Again, a fairy tale, oftentimes in a land far, far away. I believe Star Wars started in a galaxy far, far away. Well, the story of Jonah happened in a real place. Nineveh is a real city in Assyria. It eventually becomes the capital of Assyria. Joppa, it's a real port on the Mediterranean. Tarshish, the place that Jonah was fleeing to, um, its exact location isn't known, but it was believed to be in Spain. Well, King Nineveh, the king of Nineveh, he was a real person. The people of Nineveh, they were real people. Jonah, he was a real person. He's the son of Amittai, of the tribe of Benjamin. There's real people in the story of Jonah. The fourth thing a real story has to have, or a story has to have to be real, it has to have a real event. Whatever happened, whatever the story is mentioning, has to have happened. Jonah was running from God. There was a storm on the sea when Jonah was on the boat. And it doesn't matter how believable it is, how unreal it may seem, but if the, if the events that happened were real, then it's a real story. Now, I believe if dead people can be brought back to life, if God can make the sun to stand still, if a donkey can talk, then I believe that a man can spend three days in the belly of a fish. The Bible says it happened. It happened. But that's a different lesson for a different time. So just don't get hung up on the word story. But Jonah is a real event that really happened. If you remember, if you recall, um, 
Jonah's called by God to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to go, so he, so he runs from God. He, he hops a boat. He's headed over to, to Tarshish as far away as he can go. Uh, storm comes. He's thrown overboard. He's swallowed by a fish. The fish eventually spits him out. He eventually listens to God, goes to Nineveh, preaches, and Nineveh is spared. What I want to look at today about Jonah is what could we learn and how could we benefit if we could spend three days in the belly of a fish? Now, obviously, I'm talking figuratively. I don't want us to go to Ocean City, go swim out, wait for some whale to come swallow us. But figuratively, if we could spend three days in the belly of a fish. Well, before we got in the fish, there would be the time before the fish. So what did Jonah do before the fish? Jonah ran. Is that what you were going to say? That Jonah ran? He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. If you turn to the book of Jonah, we won't read the, uh, the entire story, but we'll just look at verses here and there. But in verse 2, It says, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come before me. Some translations say wicked. But Nineveh is a wicked city. And Jonah didn't want to go, so he runs. But Jonah did more than run. Jonah was trying to hide. He was trying to flee from the very presence of God. Look down in verse 3, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was trying to hide from God. If you can, if you can picture in your mind the, the geography, Nineveh is, is, is kind of northeast. And then, and then right down in the middle, about 500 miles away, is, is Gath Hefer, which is Jonah's hometown. Now, I don't know if that's where he was, but chances are that that was the area he was in, again, about 500 miles away from, from Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is northeast. Jonah goes west. He goes to the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa to catch a boat to go to Tarshish, to go to Spain. Now, remember, this is the 8th century B.C. Christopher Columbus has not sailed the Atlantic Ocean and discovered America. To the people in that present day in Jonah's time, Spain was the end of the world. That was it. Jonah was going to the end of the world. Jonah is trying to flee the very presence of God. Now, brothers and sisters, I wonder, what's your Nineveh? What are we running from? Has God called us to do something? Does God want us to do something? But we are so dead set against doing it that not only are we running, we're trying to flee the very presence of God. We can't do it. Okay, so Joni, he gets to Joppa. He jumps on a boat. What happens? God causes a storm. God created the storm. Verse 4 says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. God caused the storm. Other times that God caused weather. Genesis 7 and verse 4. God tells Noah, says, in seven days I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I've made will blot out from the face of the ground. God will send the rain. Move ahead to Exodus chapter 9. And God sending the plague, the seventh plague, God sends hail. Exodus 9 verse 18 says, Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never been in Egypt from the day until it is founded. 
Then jump down to verse 23. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth. God's in control. God caused the storm. And so what happens? The storm comes, the sailors get afraid. They start, they start throwing things overboard. They start praying to their gods, small g, but they're praying to their gods. They're, they're rowing, they're, they're emptying the boat, and of course nothing happens. But now notice the irony. Where's Jonah? He's in the belly of the boat, sound asleep, completely oblivious to what's going on. God's trying to get Jonah's attention, and Jonah's ignoring him. The sailors, he got the sailors' attention. The sailors are praying to their gods, small g. They're, they're throwing stuff overboard, but Jonah's completely oblivious to what's going on. Folks, is God calling us to do something? Is God trying to get our attention? And are we ignoring him? Are we ignoring what God is trying to do? Are we ignoring that God is trying to get our attention? Jonah was. Well, the sailors, they, they're throwing stuff over. It's not working. They're praying to their gods, small g. And now they know that Jonah's running for his life. If you look down in chapter 1, verse 10. It says, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they wake Jonah up. They know it's fault. And they know it's his fault. And they're afraid. But look at what the sailors do. Jump down to verse 13. It says, The men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more temptuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, capital L, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not us innocent blood. Lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have it done as it is pleased to you. The sailors cared more about Jonah and Jonah cared about the people in Nineveh. I can't believe, we don't know from the story, but I can't believe that this event changed the lives of the sailors. They had their gods, small g. They had their beliefs. They were praying to them, and nothing happened. Then when they knew it was Jonah, and eventually they throw Jonah overboard, and the seas calmed down, I can't believe that their lives weren't changed. They saw the power of the God, capital G. We've got to give Jonah a little credit here because Jonah is finally beginning to realize that it is all about God. Back up to verse 12, Jonah says, He, Jonah, said to them, the sailors, said, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah finally realizes God's trying to get his attention. Jonah finally realizes it's because of him. And Jonah does something that I really don't know how many of us, I, I never really realized it, but Jonah's about ready to sacrifice himself. We know a whale's going to swallow him. Jonah doesn't know that. Jonah tells the sailors, throw me over into the sea, you'll be saved. Jonah had to think that he was about to die. Jonah's finally realizing that it's God's will. It's all about God. So finally, Jonah is hurled overboard and goes into the sea. So now we go inside the fish. Notice verse 17, the end of chapter 1, verse 17, and the Lord appointed, remember that word, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. 
God appointed the fish to swallow Jonah. Now inside the fish is just Jonah and God. Jonah acknowledges God and he realizes and he acknowledges that God saved his life and his soul. Look at Jonah chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. Say, the water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. The word that we have translated as life in verse 5 and 6 is actually two different words. The one in verse 5 is the word she, which means life, physical life, Jonah's body. He realizes that God saved his life, his physical body. The word translated life in verse 6 is nepish, which means soul. Alone in the belly of the fish, Jonah realizes that it's about God and that God has saved his very soul. So now Jonah's alive in the belly of the fish. He's alone with God. It's him and God. He has time to meditate. He has time to pray. It's time to connect with God. It's just him and God. No politics, no school, no work, no bills, no family, no friends. It's just him and God. Jonah had no internet. Probably had bad Wi-Fi connection inside a fish's belly. Had no Facebook, no television. Just 72 hours, just Jonah and God. Some other people in the Bible who spent time alone, time in the belly of a fish, if you will. Look at Moses, Exodus 24, verses 17 and 18. Moses is going up on the mountain. It says he went to a cloud, and for 40 days, it was just Moses and God. Elijah, 1 Kings 19. Elijah, he, he's, trying to, he, he's fleeing uh, Jezebel, and, and, and he, he gets to a point he wants to die, but some angels come and nourish him and feed him um, and comfort him. And, and so Elijah, he goes in a cave. It says he resides in a cave, and it's just him and God. Just Elijah and God. The Apostle John, exiled to the island of Patmos. He gave us a book of Revelation. It's just him and God. Our theme this year is to be like Christ. On the board, there's some examples. <clears throat> Don't have to look them up. I'll just read through them real quick. Mark 1.35. He, or Jesus, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Luke 4.42. says he departed and went to a desolate place. Luke 5.16. He would withdraw to a desolate place and pray. Matthew 14, 13, he withdraw from there in a boat to a desolate place. And a few verses down in 23, verse 23, it says, After he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Some of these references may be the same story, but that just shows the importance. Each of the three synoptic gospel writers are writing about the same event, and it's about Jesus withdrawing, going away, to be alone, to be with God. How important must it be that we withdraw by ourselves, just us and God. Matthew 6.6, 6, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus tells us, when you pray, go into your room, Shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. Time in the belly of a fish. Just you and God. It's all about him. But after our time in the fish, we do have to come out. 
And after the fish, Jonah did come out. Fish spit them up, depending on your translation. It may say spewed them out, vomited them out. But Jonah comes out of the fish. And he's ready to obey God. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. The king makes a proclamation. The, all the Ninevites, they, 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 they fast, they pray, they repent. And Jonah 3, verse 10, tells us that God relents. They all live happily ever after. Nineveh is saved. End of story. But Jonah's not a fairy tale. This isn't the end of the story. While Nineveh rejoices, Jonah sulks. Brothers and sisters, it's all about God, all the time. The scripture reading we read this morning from Deuteronomy is part of what the Jews call the Shema. It's part of their morning and, and evening prayer. It talks about the Lord our God is one. To love the Lord our God, all our soul, all our strength, all our might. Jonah would have known that, but Jonah forgot that. Jonah, who had just been spared on a boat. Jonah, who had just been spared after he was thrown into the sea. Jonah, who had just spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish alone with God. Jonah, who witnessed what happened, an entire city being saved. And now Jonah wants to die. But God's not done with Jonah. Chapter 4, we read that Jonah goes up on a mountain on the outside skirts of the city, and he's looking down in the city, he wants to see what's going to happen to the people, and he gets hot. Jonah gets very, very hot. So look what happens in chapter 4, verse 6. Remember when Jonah, or when God appointed a fish? Look what he does here. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Jonah was glad for the created, but not the creator. Now what does God do in the next verse? It says, dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. Jonah pitied the plant because it was gone, but not the people that God wanted him to save. Are we more concerned with our own comforts and with the things we have and the things that we do and what we're used to, our habits, our things, are we more thankful for those than we're thankful for the one who gave them to us? Second Peter 3, verse 9. Peter says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish. <clears throat> but that all should reach repentance. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, talk to people he didn't care for, people he didn't like. It's God's desire that none perish, but all come to repentance. Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. It's going to go to the whole world before the end comes. And remember Mordecai, the book of Esther. Esther 4, 14. This is Mordecai talking to Esther. He says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether or not you have come 
to the kingdom for such a time as this. Brothers and sisters, what's your Nineveh? What are we running from? What are we trying to escape God? We're trying to go to the very ends of the earth to escape what God wants us to do. This can't be done. Are we too comfortable? Are we too attached to the things? Are our comforts more important than God's people? Are we listening to God? Is he trying to get our attention? And are we sound asleep in the belly of a boat? Oh, how good it would be if we could just spend time in the belly of a fish. It's time alone with God. It's you and God. How much it would change our lives. We just really devoted our lives and took our time to be alone with God. Brothers and sisters, it truly is all about God, all the time. If we can pray for you, to help you, to draw you closer to God, or maybe God's been calling you, maybe he's been tugging at your heart, and we've been running, or we've been ignoring, and maybe now's the time that you want to answer God, you want to answer him, die with him in baptism, and become a new creature, creature in him, if we can help. Please let us know. Please come. Always stay on sync.